Ephesians chapter 4, y'all. Let's get into it. Here we are. Thank you very much. Ephesians chapter 4, if you're using the Blue Bible. It's 11.58. Ephesians 4, we've been going through 17 through 32 for a little while. A little while? Uh-huh. Dig it deep, brother. Slow. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Uh, be patient. Uh, hearing, uh, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Remember, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says... When He ascended on high, He led captives in His train, and He gave gifts to men. What does ascended mean except that He also descended to the lower earthly regions? Verse 10, He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was He who gave some uh, to be apostles, and some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, that they might prepare God's people for works of service in order that the body of Christ might be built up, and this is to continue, verse 13, until we all reach maturity, unity, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, 14. And then we will no longer be babies, infants, people who are tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the trickery, the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. 15. Instead, hey guys, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head, that is Christ. 16. From Him, from Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So again, where verse 1 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And then now verse 17, So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. So if you have a study guide, everybody have one? Grab a study guide. $20 each. Not really. Hey. <laughs> bit too quick. I was going to give you 30 Okay. So they're at the top of your study guide. Ephesians 4, 1 and 17, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you. That word urge you. Uh, you've heard the word uh, uh, parallel. Yeah, what is parallel parking? Besides easy. Not even, huh? Uh, parallel parking, parallel lines, li line up side by side, right? The word here is a prisoner for the Lord. I urge you. The word is parakaleo. Uh, para means to lay alongside. Kaleo means to call out. So if I'm speaking, if I'm calling, if I'm talking, then I'm talking along the same line. I'm speaking along the same lines. I'm saying the same thing. Um, you you kind of have the same word with confession. Uh, where growing up Catholic, I was talking to someone today, uh, growing up Catholic, we were taught to, to confess to, to priests. We were taught to, to go to the Catholic church and go in the little phone booth and, and tell them all your dirty laundry and they take notes and hold it against you. And now they, they, give you, they give you 25 Hail Marys and three Our Fathers and 28 Glory Bees and tell you to go out and do the thing and then you go out and you're all clean again. Except that's not what the Bible teaches, right? But confession means to say the same thing alongside of. Um, so if the Bible says not to lie, and the phone rings, and they say, hello, is Greg there? And I say, uh, and Greg goes, no. I go, uh, he, Greg wants me to tell you he's not here right now. You know, that doesn't count, right? Yeah. But it's just not a big old lie, it's just a little fib. But if God says, bear the truth, don't bear false witness, then if I call it a fib, or I say it's not a big deal, I'm not saying the same thing about that untruth that God is. Where God says it's a lie, when I speak the word alongside of what God says it is, now I'm speaking 
a parallel word, a parakaleo. Does that make sense? So a parakaleo. So if uh, if 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 uh, Lauren comes alongside me, come over here. Babe. Are you scared? Mm. Oh, I'm excited. Okay. Most people most people think the word encouragement is is this. So encouragement is is an attaboy. How's or that? If, again? Like this. Or if you're a football player. Sorry. <laughs> But the word encourage in the Bible is that. It's the word urge. It's to speak the same thing alongside of. But it's not just to speak the same thing alongside of to, to make to feel better. It's to make better. So the word parakaleo might be this. You know me, I, I, I told that guy today, I'm not a, actually I told someone yesterday, I'm not a, a hold your hand, sing kumbaya kind of a pastor. I'm a kind of a kick you in the butt kind of a pastor. That's parakaleo. Parakaleo is to say the words, not to make you feel better, but to help you be better. Does that make sense? So when you, thank you. So when you come alongside somebody, that's what Paul is talking about. I urge you. I'm coming alongside you and I'm telling you what God says, not to make you feel better. I want you to be better. So I urge you, as a prisoner of the Lord, he was literally a prisoner, but he wasn't in jail for doing bad. He was in in jail. He was uh, in prison for doing good, right, for representing Jesus. I'm, I'm begging you, I'm imploring you, and the reason that I'm saying these words is I intend to instruct you. Okay? Now most people don't like to be told. I mean, we're fine with it, aren't we? Who likes to be told? Who likes to be told that they're wrong? But that's often what parakaleo is. Parakaleo is not just to say things that make you feel better. It's to tell you what you need to hear to be better. So, Parakaleo, I beg you, I implore you with the intent to instruct, to live a life. We're still here at the top, right? To live a life. That idea of living a life is not, uh, is not this. These are decisions. <laughs> and I want, I want this part of my life to get, no, I need this. Okay. this. These are decisions of my life. Don't take my life away from me. That's what our life kind of looks like. Our life looks like this. And so if I want all these to go into the cup, I covered it just in case I'm a good shot. And I do this. I might hit it. Those are good intentions. Those are desires. But that's not the word here. This word to live a life means this. My poor coffee. It means to take this decision and not just like I did. It means to intentionally aim it, push it, and drop it. So it means to, it, what you're supposed to do when you get into the car and you get behind the wheel. Not like me. I can put on my makeup, eat a hamburger, put on lipstick, talk on my phone. But you're not supposed to, right? You're supposed to tend into it. Yeah, that's the way you're supposed to live your life. That's, that's what this says. I've got a mess over here. Don't tell. If anybody's looking online, what do you think they're thinking? As a prisoner for the Lord then, I, I beg you, I urge you, I implore you with the intent to instruct you. I want to change your life, Paul says. I'm telling you this because I, I insist that you change. I'm not telling you this because I like to hear my words. I'm not telling you this because, you know, we're just hanging out and I'm trying to fill an hour. I'm telling you this because I intend to instruct you to take the steering wheel of your life and put it somewhere. If you want it to go left, go left. If you want it to go right, go right. If you want to stop, hit the brake. If you want to go forward, go. Don't let your life drift. Don't, don't, don't let somebody else call the shots for your life. Because if you don't make the decisions for your life, somebody else will. If you don't decide where you're going to put your money, somebody else will. If you don't decide where you're going to put your time, somebody else will. If you don't decide where you're going to put your thoughts, somebody else will. I beg you, I urge you, I, I implore you with the intent to instruct you to deliberately drive the decisions of your life. You put your life where you want it to be. To what end? I want you to be the kind of person that God wants you to be. I want you to walk worthy of the calling that you've received. So where he talks about, I'm, 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 I'm calling you to live according to your call, is literally what he's saying. I'm parakaleoing, I'm, I'm speaking a, a word alongside to live according to your calling. Um, basically, you've been invited by God 
to live a certain kind of life. So let's say here's the life that God wants you to live. Okay, there it is. And here are the decisions of my life. And I have, I have every intention of getting to God. Yeah, I'm going to make the mess again. I have every intention of getting to God. I have every intention of, of living that good and godly life. <sighs> eh, not bad. Better than most. I at least blew in the right direction. But he says, don't guess. Don't hope. Take your life, take every decision of your life, and intentionally drive it there. If that's the kind of life you want to live, put it there. So that's what we have in verse 1, and that's what we have in verse 17. You've been invited by God to live that life, so put the decisions of your life right there. Please conduct yourself like the Christian that Christ commands, is the idea of verse 1 and verse 17. So I tell you this, and I insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Uh, I was telling Gary that uh, most of the time, I, I use the NIV. But when I'm studying, I study from a lot of different versions, and, and I go to the original languages, not because I understand Greek and Hebrew. I don't, but I read guys who do, right? And verse 17 is the only verse that really bugged me because it, it, it didn't exactly say this. Most of the verses don't exactly say that, but you, you have a King James with you, don't you, Gary? Yeah. You going to read 17, please? And, and while he's reading that, look here on your study guide. This is the NIV. This is, this is what I'm teaching from. Listen to the King James. This I say, therefore, and testify to the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their own mind. Okay, in the vanity of their own mind. Go from, from the back and work your way up. The vanity of their own mind its the emptiness of their thinking, the futility of their thinking. That, that's the same thing, right? There's nothing different there. Uh, no longer live as, as the Gentiles do. Is that what it said? As the Gentiles do? Yes. Yeah. So that, that's the same. The difference, listen, listen to the first few words. 17 in the NIV says, And so this I insist in the Lord. Listen to the King James, the first phrase. This I say, therefore. This I say, therefore. And testify in the Lord. Testify in the Lord. I, I don't get that same urgency that I have here in the NIV. Now, the fact that I have the urgency here doesn't mean that I have permission to just say, well, believe the NIV then, because the King James is too wishy-washy. No, because maybe the original lends itself more to that than this, because I think that the King James doesn't exactly say this. I don't have a, I, I had a problem because I went back, I, I, again, I don't know Greek, I, you know, I took Greek classes, Greek language classes and such, and just enough to realize that I don't need any business messing with it. But I go to Strong's Concordance. Any of you have, have access to these, these books or online or, or the actual books? And, and I went back and, and I looked, and it looks like it's more like Gary's reads, so that it's, it's an important thing, but you don't get that urgency from verse 17. But through the whole rest of the chapter, I get the urgency. Because the rest of the chapter says, don't live your life like this, don't live your life like that. That's what God has invited you to live. Take your life and live it like that. So that's the urgency. So I may not find it in that one verse. So for those who are, should I read the NIV or the King James or the, the whatever, you know, the American Standard Version, I think, I think those matters are important, but I think it's really only important to figure out what God wants. And you don't want to decide what God wants from one verse. You want to decide what God wants from, from everything you read in Scripture. So if you're more comfortable with the King James, read it. If you're more comfortable with the NIV, I think read it. The problem is, are we doing it? Uh, does that make sense? Okay, questions? Am I fired yet? What are you looking at her for? I'm asking you. <laughs> All in favor say aye. So... Going now to the, is that blue? This is where we've been over the last couple of weeks. From this passage, uh, from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 to 32, it talks about six, six specific, and, and all through Scripture you find more than six. But in this particular passage, he tells you how to drive your life. Where should I drive my life to? Uh, if, if I want to get to Broadway and Rio Bravo. Okay, if I want to get to 
Rio Bravo and Broadway. In my mind, I can see the corner of Rio Bravo and Broadway. But if I'm actually driving, I need to decide whether I'm gonna point my truck toward the block wall or toward Isleta. I pick Isleta, and then I have to decide whether to go left toward Rio Bravo or right. So I'm gonna to decide to go left toward Rio Bravo, and then I have to decide, am I gonna pass the light, or am I gonna make a right-hand turn or a left-hand turn at Rio Bravo? I'm kind of belaboring the point, but you get it? To get there, there are a series of decisions to get to that corner, right? He gives us six. He gives us six uh, way, waypoints, six landmarks. The first one we saw is in verse 25. Watch your truthfulness. Therefore, each of you must quit lying, put off falsehood, and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Why? Because you're a part of the same body. You know, people lie, uh, the Bible says, to, to get ahead, to get their own way. Uh, because they're ashamed, because they're embarrassed, because, and God says, look, you, the, the, the bottom line is you want to you wanna contribute to the health of the body. It's not just every man for himself. You, you want to make sure that everybody gets to Rio Bravo and Broadway together. You want to make sure everybody gets where God wants them to be. Encourage them. So <laughs> do that by watching what you say. Don't lie to each other too. Watch your truthfulness. Watch your temper. 26. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Does he say that every time you get angry, it's sin? I mean, it may be. Every time you get angry, it might be sin. But is, is there a place in the Bible for anger that's not sin? Yeah. You give me a couple of examples. I mean, can you think of anybody who got angry in the Bible and evidently wasn't sinning? Kind of, kind of simple. Jesus. Yeah, the Bible says Jesus got angry. Did Jesus ever sin? No, Jesus never did. Uh, any example that we might think of David or, or Moses or Paul, uh, usually when they got mad, they were usually doing something stupid or bad, but not always. It's possible to be angry. When Jesus got angry, he got angry because uh, uh, his father was being dissed, because God the Father was being treated with such disdain and disrespect, and he got angry over that. But when Jesus was mistreated, he didn't get angry over that. He looked with pity at the people. Even on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He, he stood over Jerusalem and he cried and, and he said, God, they're, they're like sheep without a shepherd. They don't, they don't know. They don't understand what they're doing. And Jesus got angry. He went into the temple. He kicked the tables over. Yeah, he got, he got angry, but he never sinned. So be careful what you get angry about. Generally, if you're angry because you didn't get your way, probably out of bounds. Yeah. So watch your truthfulness, watch your temper, watch your toil. I told you last week I needed a, w, I needed a T word for work. Yeah. 28, anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. He must work doing something useful with their own hands. And not just, not just a hobby. Hobbies are fine. Not just a you know, monkeying around, and boy, I like to stay Can busy. What's that? Can I go, go back? Yeah, back? sure. So which one, back to 26? Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Why? Why, why do you think? What does the Bible say about it? What does that, what's the implication there? Um, it looks like, anybody, anybody want to throw something in? Why, why does the Holy Spirit tell Paul to tell us that if you do get angry, make sure you're not sinning, and if you get angry, make sure you don't keep that anger. What does that anger become? Uh, bitterness. Long enough, it becomes resentment. And it not only burns you up. I mean, if somebody does something stupid to you, something mean to you, and it's just eating you up. Does it bother them? Psst, they're probably not even thinking about it. You know, it's, it's eating you up, it's burning you up, but they're not even thinking about it. But inside you, it, become a, it, it can become a root of bitterness, and that can give Satan a way to glom on to you, a way to climb on to you, a way to hang on. So the, 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 the idea is forgiveness, not wrath, not bitterness. Is he doing something with one of my decisions? Yeah. One of my pieces of direction? Is this still talking about the body? I think, I think generally speaking, when we're reading through the epistles, generally I think he's always talking about the body. He's always talking about brothers and sisters in the faith. He's always talking about the local expression. So in our case, it would be the Southwest Church. So if I'm mad at him, don't do it. I forgive him. <laughs> yeah, good to forgive him, yes. Yeah, generally speaking, yeah, if you're mad at the boss, you're mad at the neighbor, you're mad at the 
dog, you're mad at the mailman, you're mad at the whatever. Generally, yeah, deal with it if you can. You, you can't always because it's a, it's a, you know, it takes two to, I'm not going to say tango, it's a dance word. But it takes two and sometimes you can only take care of your side, right? But so generally, yeah, the principle is uh, in your anger, don't sin. But generally, these passages are talking about how it works here in the local expression. Yeah. Um, uh, he, he touches a little bit on spiritual giftedness in uh, was it verses uh, 16, starting at verse 11. It was he who gave some, it was Christ who gave uh, some individuals to be apostles, and some he made prophets. And some he made evangelists, and some he made, and the word is together, pastor teachers. It's not some pastors and some teachers. The pastor teachers in, in, the, in the Greek is, it goes together. And there are some who believe that there's still a, the office of apostle for today, and there's still the office of a prophet today. I don't think there is. It's okay. It's not going to hurt my feelings if I get to heaven and God says, ah, there were still apostles and prophets. So, okay, fine. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, turn, turn left. Two chapters, one, two chapters, but one page. Ephesians chapter two, verse twenty uh, or nineteen. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people, and you are members of God's household. God's household is the the body of Christ. Verse twenty, which has been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. Uh, the, the analogy is a little bit silly, but if the foundation has been laid, I mean, if the construction guys came in and, and they'd already, you know, laid the trenches and they'd already thrown the rebar in there, and they'd already done their measurements and they ordered the concrete and they, they poured the footing. Uh, when, when the footing is poured, usually when, when, when I've been involved in building, the houses weren't that, that huge and it was a monolith pour. So it wasn't a two-step thing where we did the, the footing foundation and then later do the floor. We'd pour the floor and the footing at the same time. Well, once that was done, you know, you, you, you throw the water on it, you let it cure, you know, you do what you're supposed to do and in colder weather, you cover it up a little bit. But in a day or two, when you're ready to, to, to do something, when the, when the construction guys come to work, are they gonna pour another footing or foundation? No, the footing and foundation has been poured. Now we start building the walls. Now you start building the superstructure. So there, there are many who believe that the, the office of apostle and prophet is still for today. I think it's over because the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And now what God has given us is evangelists to go reach people for Jesus and pastors and teachers to help them become more like Jesus. Um, so, evangelists and pastor teachers help get the church. Uh, uh, eh, they basically they're the, they're the guys who go to Lowe's and Home Depot and buy the stuff, throw it in the back of the truck. They come and they build a building. <laughs> eh, the evangelists fill it. The pastor teachers teach the people, and the reason for that is uh, twelve. Uh, to prepare God's people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach to unity uh, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Um, the, the spiritual gifts that we find here, you only find four there. Apostle, prophet, um, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But in 1 Corinthians, is it 12? find, I don't know, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 more gifts, uh, teaching and giving and encouraging and whatevering and whatever. And then in 1 Peter chapter 4, there's another bunch of gifts. Yeah. So these spiritual gifts, generally speaking, I might exercise my spiritual gift if I have the spiritual gift of, let, let's say giving. I don't know that I do. I don't think I do. But let's say that, that I have the spiritual gift of, of giving. Well, I'm, I, might, I might exercise that outside. I might be generous outside the church. But primarily those gifts were given to bless you. Primarily the gifts of teaching, spiritual gift, were given so that you can bless us. The gift of exhortation, 
whatever. Exhortation is to come alongside and say the things that you need to, to become more like Jesus. Those gifts were given to build up the church. So that, that was still kind of in answer. Generally speaking, when you're reading what God tells us to do in the epistles, it's generally to benefit whatever local expression that you attend. It's for your church. Not everybody believes that, but when they get to be with Jesus, they'll see the truth. They'll see the light. Or was I for? Uh, watch your toil. Anyone who's been stealing must no longer steal, but must work um, doing something useful with their own hands so that now they can have something to share with those in need. So it's not enough to quit stealing. If you've been stealing, quit stealing. But he doesn't want you to just get out of the negative column. He wants you to get into the positive. So those who steal now should work. Why? To buy groceries. That's not what Matthew 5 says. Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, the Bible says God gives you whatever you eat. Well, to buy clothes. Well, the Bible says whatever you're wearing, God gave that to you. Well, so I can pay for my house payment. Well, the Bible says that whatever bridge I sleep under is a gift from God. Not that we're supposed to be irresponsible. We are supposed to pay our bills. And if in our bills we have groceries and clothes and a house, well, yeah, a car, and you know, be, be responsible. But the Bible says we're supposed to work as a matter of worship. We work to be responsible before the Lord. We work uh, to, to, to be industrious, not just to be busy. Busy work is, to me, dumb, but to stay busy in a way that will somehow connect with God's stuff, to do things that somehow will benefit the body of Christ. Doesn't mean you can't do other things that don't, but primarily there should be something about what we do that connects with the body of Christ. It may be as simple as working a job so that you have more money to give to ministry. It may be that what you do out there directly connects to, to reaching people and building people in the faith. Um, and then number four, this is where we are tonight. Uh, verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only speak what is helpful for the building others up according to their needs. And again, we're talking about primarily in the church. We ought to speak in a, in a beneficial way for everybody around us, but primarily we're talking about in the church that it might benefit those who listen. Okay, page two. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Watch your talk. The idea of unwholesome, uh, the, the words that were used to, to translate uh, to give us unwholesome talk, they mean uh, a piece of fruit that somehow fell into the fridge and you don't see it, but a few days later you smell it. It's that. It's, uh, it's, it's whatever's in the back of the crisper under the good lettuce, the bad lettuce. It's, yeah, it's rotten. It's putrid. It, uh, can you smell putrid? I don't mean right now, but yeah. Something that's putrid, you can smell. Something that's rotten, you can smell. Something that's corrupted, something that's useless. Something that's bad, something that's just, just pointless. Don't let anything like that come out of your mouth. That's kind of clear. When he's talking about coming out of your mouth, he's talking specifically about words, our language, our conversation. Huh? Um, so uh, give me some examples. I mean, do, do, do these have to be bad words? Does, does the Bible... Huh? No, 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 don't give me examples. <laughs> well, he perked up there, didn't he? Um, is this... Huh? No cussing? Huh? No gossiping? Yeah. Big time, no gossiping, but it's fun. All the women get in the back of the church. Supposed to be All the women get in the back of the church and gossip. How else are you going to know what to pray about if you don't gossip, brother? <laughs> gossiping, uh, cursing. Um, should should blessings and cursings come from the same source? But is cursings is is cursing bad words? Well, you know me. I don't think you got to have a potty mouth. But one man's bad word is another guy's. I don't know. It's always a bad word. Um, if you read the King James, there are lots of bad words in there. I can't read a lot of the words from the Old Testament, and some of them in the New. I, I can't. I have to change them. Five. Five. <laughs> Which five? Don't tell me. <laughs> um, I, I don't. The King James word for donkey, I don't use. I, I, I don't. When I hear somebody else say it, I, sometimes I giggle. I shouldn't. But, I, I don't, amen. huh? I should say amen. Uh, even even when uh, uh, every once in a while, back back when there was a TV show uh, called.
called Jack Donkey. Yeah, no, what was it called? Now that I said that, it was, right? It was. Yeah. On MTV, did you watch that a lot? No, but I was aware of it. <laughs> and so when it would come up in conversation, I remember that's what I'd call it. Yeah. Um, some people, that, I mean, the guys that I talked to, the church guys, they just say the words. They just say the words. I think we ought to be a little uncomfortable saying words like that. But some people, it doesn't bother them. Say the King James, a brother Stephen in Phoenix would use the word, wouldn't he? What's his name? Steve, what's the pastor's name? He would read it. He would read it? Yeah. So I, I don't say the King James word for donkey. God's word. It's God's word. And if it's there. In the Old Testament, in, in 1 Samuel and uh, 1 King, Kings and Samuel, uh, God, has a God has a phrase. The King James has a phrase for males. You remember what it is? Don't say it. You remember what it is? If by tomorrow I haven't killed every male then blah, 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 blah. And in the King James, it's every dude who pees against the wall. But he doesn't say pee. He uses another word. Yeah, yeah. With the King James, E-E-T-H. Everybody who peeth against the wall, except it's the other word. I don't say that word. You almost spelled it. I almost spelled the whole thing. Um, I've read, I don't know that I buy it, but I've read that where the Apostle Paul said that uh, my old life was was refuse and in the King James I think it's dung I've read that that word was the word that I would never use for poopy but I've read that that's the word that Paul used that he used the, the colloquial word for refuse for dung Paul potty mouth literally right can you imagine having in your mouth that's gross isn't it do you think I'm going to tell that story? <laughs> that's what corruption is. And that's, what, that's the way I see bad words. But everybody doesn't. Everybody doesn't see cussing that way. Most guys, they don't even recognize it when they cuss. They don't. They might recognize it here. Oh, I'm sorry, pastor. Then I'm pastor. Yeah. But if they talk like, if it slips out here, they talk like that out there. Yeah. Right? And... I, God has a lot to say about it. Not so much because those words are bad. In one, in one culture, you say that word and they don't even know what you're talking about. How is that a bad word? Um, but it's not the word itself. It's the connection to our culture. Why would we want to identify with that? Why would we want to identify with that kind of language if we're a Christian? That's the reason to not cuss. That's the reason to not say those words. Don't let any nasty, putrid, smelly word come out of your mouth. In your conversation, no particular word. Watch how you speak. Only say the things, the third line, fourth line, only say the things that are helpful. And the word is what you think, good, beneficial, constructive. I think this is what makes a distinction. Again, this comes back to, is this for everybody or is this for the church? I think it's for everybody, but he's writing specifically for the church. You should be careful and make sure that the things that are coming out of your mouth in conversation, your words, your, 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 everything about everything should be for the building up of others. Edify them. You're, you're promoting the growth of the person in church. What should I say? Whatever they need. Again, not just to make them feel good, to make them be good. Not just to make them feel better, but to help them be better. So be sure to speak in such a way that it will benefit those who listen. It's for their good. It's for their growth. It's for their godliness. Right? So this is why James says there, is it blue on your page? This is why James says uh, regarding, uh, we were talking earlier about ordination, about being licensed, about people who pastor. I, I, I believe that, that every believer is given the privilege of, of serving God. You don't have to be licensed. You don't have to be ordained to, to minister, to serve God, to teach for God. James says, slow your roll, buddy. Not many of you should, should want to become teachers. He tells us in other places, you ought to go out of your way to be a teacher. But he says, I, I, want you to, I want you to go into this with eyes wide open. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that what we, uh, we know, we know ah, mm -hmm. not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. 
Verse 2. Look, nobody's perfect. We all stumble in many ways. I mean, the guy who's never at fault in what they say, that guy's perfect, man. He's able to keep his whole body in check. Good luck with that. But that's the goal. Verse 3. Look, when we put bits in the horse's mouths to make them obey us, that little, that little bit that's in their mouth can turn the whole animal, the entire horse. Or look at a ship. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder, and it goes wherever the pilot wants it to go. Verse 5. In the same way that you can move a big old horse with a little bit, you can move a giant ship with a small rudder. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but man, it brags like it's big. Consider what a great forest can be set on fire by a tiny spark. 6. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. That, that uh, thing that we found there in verse 29, don't let any unwholesome talk, anything rotten, putrefied, disgusting, corrupt. The tongue can turn the whole body into that nasty, smelly mess. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life. Instead of placing it where God wants it to be, it sets it on fire makes it destructive, and it is set on fire by hell itself. Verse 7, all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles, sea creatures have been tamed and have been tamed by mankind. Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Uh, the 12-step mantra, what, what is it? One day, one day at a time. That's what James is saying regarding the tongue. You're never really going to fully control it. You're never really going to fully control it. The better you do with your tongue, the better you're going to do with your life. The better you do with your mouth, the better you're going to do with your life. You're never going to fully get it under control. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father. And with that same tongue we curse human beings who've been made in the similitude of God, in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praises and cursings. Brothers, sisters, it shouldn't be like that. 11. Can fresh water and salty water flow from the same spring? Well, the answer is not supposed to. Psalm 141.3, the top of page 3. Good prayer. God, put a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Why? So I won't say something stupid. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep a watch over the door of my lips. Colossians 3.8 Now you must also rid yourselves of, of all kinds of awful stuff. Anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. Ah, by the way, don't lie to each other. Don't let anything nasty, putrid, corrupt bad, unhealthy, unhelpful come out of your mouth. If our heart is right, someone said, I didn't say this, someone, someone said, if our heart is right, our character will be right, our conduct will be right, and our conversation then will be right. What do you think? If your heart is right, your character will be right. If your character is right, your conduct will be right. If your conduct is right, your conversation, uh, basically your behavior will be right. You know, what did Jesus say about what comes out of my lips? Uh, whatever comes out of my mouth, it's coming out of my heart. The problem is not the words I use. The problem is the wickedness that I have. Proverbs 15, 12. Words are important. I used to believe this. I guess I still do. A person finds joy in giving an apt reply. How good is a well-placed word? Proverbs 25, 11. I used to believe this one too. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a ruling rightly given. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is the rebuke of a wise judge to a listening ear. I used to believe that a well-placed word can change a life from verses like this. But now I realize that a well-placed word just makes people mad. Should I still believe it? He says it. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is the rebuke, is the wise word of a wise judge to a 
listening ear. Rebuke a fool? Ooh, it's not going to turn out good for you. But we're supposed to. We're supposed to say the right things. We're supposed to say what a person needs to hear. Uh, good luck with that. Colossians 4, 6. I guess I, guess I still believe them. Colossians 4, 6. Let your conversation, the words you say, let them always be full of grace. Seasoned with salt. I'm good at that part. So that you may know how to answer everyone. What does that mean? Let your conversation be full of grace. <coughs> Is it more than just be nice, or is that enough? I think always our, our mind should be on what is the connection to Christ. Um, if, if, a person, if, a, if a person is doing a stupid thing and you encourage them, you're being nice, right? If they're doing something that's good and you encourage them, I, I guess that's nice. But if they're doing something good that's keeping them from getting to God... It's not good to encourage them. Does that make sense? I mean, that's a personal thing. If a person is doing good, but it's not leading them to God, I have a hard time cheering them on. I mean, that's a personal problem, but what are your thoughts? Is it possible that a person can good works themselves into hell? Yeah, yes. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. They can be good people. Except that the Bible says there's none that do it good. No, not one. The Bible says that all of our good works are just like a pile of filthy rags. But a person in this culture, if they can stay out of jail, and if they can be good neighbors, and if they can be decent, decent citizens, I mean, we feel like, well, you know, leave them alone. Encourage them. Don't discourage them, Tony. They believe in God. Leave them alone. They can good works themselves right into hell. They need to be told, good enough isn't good enough. But how many people want to hear that? I think that's what it means to have your conversation uh, always full of grace, uh, seasoned with salt, so that you know how to give an answer. In conversations, I, you know, of course I'll talk about the weather, and I don't talk about sports much because I'm kind of ignorant, you know, about sports. Huh? I, I know the big games going on because everybody's talking about them, but I don't usually follow that stuff. You know, I'd be a horrible barber because I, you know, I couldn't just talk about stuff that they want to talk about. Uh, <coughs> Generally, when I'm in a conversation with a stranger, I don't, I don't drive them to religious talking, but we somehow kind of end up there, and that's kind of cool. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I think. If not, I feel like it's a wasted conversation. What, what if they go away encouraged and happy? They might happy themselves right into hell. And, and people, more people would like me if I'd be nicer and not worry so much about their spiritual condition. But if I'm talking to someone who's definitely not a Christian, how can I let them get away without at least trying? At least trying. Um, uh, believe it or not, I don't hit everybody you know, between the eyes with a two by four. But generally, I get around to telling them how stupid I am. And that was easy. So somehow, I get around to telling them how I ended up doing this. And usually that's by getting trapped on a porch with a Jehovah's Witness, except I didn't get trapped on a porch with a Jehovah's Witness. I got trapped on a billboard with a Baptist preacher for eight hours a day, five days a week for eight months. And people don't mind hearing that because they like seeing somebody in trouble. They like seeing somebody uncomfortable. And I can tell the story, and I can tell my testimony just pretty quick. I, I usually take as much time as it seems like they'll give me to let things kind of sink in. And sooner or later, without telling them, you need this, you need the way Carl used to tell me, I basically tell them what Carl used to tell me. So it's like using a sock puppet. Hey, puppet, how do I get to heaven? And then I tell them what I want to tell them by telling them what Carl told me. You're a sinner, and Jesus is God, and He died for your sins and was buried and rose from the dead. What are you going to do about it? And, and, I, and I just I, I try to end up there. If I don't end up talking to somebody about the Lord, then I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's overkill, but I feel like it's kind of a wasted conversation. It, it's okay to lay foundation. You know, I guess it's okay to plant seed and, and water. You don't know, it doesn't always have to be beat them over the head with the gospel. But if I only have one chance... Uh, Carl kind of infected me. Make them mad or glad. 
<laughs> Tell them the truth, man. Tell them the truth. Luke 4, 22. Everyone spoke well of Jesus and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Now, think of this verse and don't, don't, don't just look at the words and go, oh, everybody loved everything Jesus said. If you think back to everything in the Bible, did everybody love everything that Jesus said? Uh, where did he end up because of everything he said? Crucified. They were going to throw him off a cliff. They were going to throw rocks at him. They, they, they hated him. They lied about him. They mistreated him. And they finally killed him. What the heck does that mean? Everybody spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Remember the other place where they asked, Isn't this Joseph's son? It's because he spoke with authority and not like the scribes and Pharisees who sounded like they were reading somebody else's sermons. They weren't, just, they weren't just preaching something they read somewhere. Jesus told the truth because He was the truth. So that all spoke well of Him. I don't know exactly what that means. They were amazed at the gracious words. The word gracious, the word grace, it, it, it refers to, to being gifted by God. Jesus spoke with the, the gift that God had given Him. And then it's kind of hard to think through because Jesus is God. But the Bible says that He submitted to Father, the Father who is God. And, and God the Father blessed Him and ordained Him and, 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 and moved Him and spoke to Him. Jesus said at one point, I don't say anything I haven't heard from my Father. What the heck does that mean? I don't know. But here it says that people recognized that He was full of grace. Yeah, the part of the Hail Mary that's not from the pit of hell. Uh, I forgot it. How does it go? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Yeah? Uh, the second part of the Hail Mary, that's the part that's from the pit of hell. But the first part, yeah, um, she was full of grace. Jesus was full of grace. We're supposed to be full of gifted speech seasoned with salt always ready Peter says I don't have the verse here but always ready to give an account for the hope that lieth in us yeah how did you get saved I'm glad you asked that question most of the time they're not going to ask the question so you need to figure out a way to answer it before they ask it our words two minute testimony, two minute testimony. sometimes we don't get the full two minutes Jason, Jason hold them down full Nelson evangelism or is that half which one is that? <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> Our word should serve to the building up of their need. Strengthening at the point of their weakness. Who am I talking about? Who are they? Other people in the body of Christ. Other people in your church. Whatever church you're going to. Whatever church you've tripped over right now. Whatever church you're a part of. Whoever's listening online. Whatever church you're a part of. That's the local expression that God is holding you accountable for. God wants you to contribute to the health of that body. I understand what preachers mean. You know, I don't, <coughs> I don't get hung up on the numbers. They say, and I don't get hung up on, you know, nickels and noses and bodies and bucks and bricks. I'm doing this for the kingdom. I'm doing this for Jesus. Well, yeah, of course, and it sounds good. But if, 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 if I hired you to work in my field... And at harvest time, you bring in two bales of alfalfa or two baskets of strawberries. I don't know. Where do strawberries you grow those? I don't know where they come from. Come from Albertsons. I don't know. You, you bring in two baskets of strawberries or you bring in two bales of hay when the farmer next door has got 250 bales of hay and he's got 57 bushels of strawberries. Well, I know the Bible says I'm not supposed to envy what he's got and you know compare my ministry with his ministry. On the other hand, if the fields are the same and the right next door the soils are the same and it's the same seed and it's the same water and he's got 250 bales and I've got two bales, well, if I'm the boss, I'm going to ask, what's the monkey going on here? Well, I'm just doing it for the kingdom. God blesses as God blesses. God brings in the harvest. As God brings in the harvest, you're fired. Get me another guy who's going to get me 250 bales out of that field. Like that guy can get 250 bales out of his field. We never stop to look at our harvest. Uh, we. I'm saying that generally we don't worry as much as we should about how well we're doing. The Bible says in John 15, Jesus said, I, 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 I'm 
connected to the Father and you should be connected to me. I'm, in the, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Uh, he that abideth in me and I abideth in him shall bring forth much fruit. I've ordained you that you bring forth fruit, much fruit. We don't even look in our baskets. We don't even look in the back of the truck to see if, if we had a harvest. We're just living for the Lord. I don't have to tear up another Kleenex toy. <laughs> we have good intentions. We want to live for the Lord. We want to serve the Lord. We want to honor the Lord. But we're not taking the part of our life that we have control over, the words of our lips, our money, our time, and we're not placing it specifically where we know it's going to do the most good for God in the body that we're responsible for. Kind of looks like that's what he's talking about here. <laughs> good intentions? It's for the kingdom. Okay, whatever. You know, I, I realize that everything that I'm doing, I, I don't understand everything that I'm doing. I realize that, that God is working behind the scenes. I get that. But God doesn't want me to be irresponsible and just say, well, God's going to work it out. If my job is to fill that cup and my cup's always empty, I'm not being responsible. Now, you, you can't make somebody get saved, right? I mean, you can't make them be born again. You can't make them be faithful in church. You can't make them support a church. You can't make them work in church. You, you can't make them do that. But if we let people off the hook by not saying the words that they need to hear, to be faithful in their stewardship, to be faithful in their service, to be faithful in their, their, their work before the Lord. I think maybe the stuff coming out of our mouth isn't poopy, but is it profitable? Is it beneficial? Our words should serve to the building up of their need, strengthening them at their point of weakness. What's their point of weakness? I don't know. What's keeping them from having a full harvest? What's keeping them from bringing in kids who can get saved? What's keeping them from bringing in people that are going to fill the pews and hear the gospel? What's keeping them from hearing whatever our ministry is? If we have a cafe, we don't right now. If we have a band, if we have a cleaning the outside, if we have a pulling weeds, if we have a clean the church ministry, if we have a counting the money or a preaching the sermons, what, what, whatever, whatever stuff is going on in your local expression of church, whatever the weakness is, Figure out how to strengthen that. That's your job. Your job isn't just to do it. That would be easy. But your job isn't just to do it. Your job is to find someone who's gifted to do that and then help them be successful. That's a little harder. But that's what discipleship is. Discipleship is not doing it. Discipleship is teaching someone else how to do it. Does that make sense? Sometimes our words, I'm at the bottom of page three. This is the best part. Sometimes your words will soothe people Sometimes your words will sting people, but your words should always make strong people. That's what it is to parakaleo. That's what it is to encourage. That's what it is to urge them. That's what it is to disciple. That's what it is to make sure that the words coming out of your lips are profitable for God. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, Jesus said. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a, true, a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes, Jesus said. How can you who are so evil say anything good? The mouth is only speaking what the heart is full of. 35. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man will bring evil things out of the evil stored up in him. 36. But I'm telling you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every pointless, worthless, empty word that they have spoken. I'm in trouble. <laughs> 37. For by your words you will be excused, acquitted. And by your words you will be condemned. Watch your talk. Watch what you say. Make sure that what you're saying is contributing to the health of your church. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, hold Christ up as Lord. Revere Him as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Do this with gentleness. Do it with respect. Make sure that you don't sound like a hypocrite. You have a clear conscience. So that those who accuse you of stuff, they speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ, might be ashamed because they're saying bad things about you that aren't true, 17. But it is better, if it is God's will, 
that you end up suffering for doing good rather than for doing evil. Yeah. Be good. Do good. Bad grammar, but talk good. Speak well. Talk good. Amen. I have to answer for those words? Uh oh. Stop speaking here. Let's pray. God, help us use our words well. Help us speak clearly. Help us speak in a way that is profitable, in a way that is spiritual, in a way that is helpful, but in a way that uh, uh, brings honor to you and builds up the people around us. Thank you for this place. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these people. Thank you for what you're doing here. God, we pray that you would do more. Uh, we pray that you would do more through us. We pray that we would uh, be built up. Uh, God, if uh, I'm indeed the person that you want to be the pastor teacher here, then I should be speaking words that build up the people who are hearing. And then they in turn should be responsibly taking that truth and doing it and reaching others and showing others and sharing with others that they might do the work of the ministry. Pastor, teachers, and evangelists have been given by you for the health of the church. Jesus, I pray that we would be a healthy church. Help us uh, watch our truthfulness and help us watch our temper. Help us watch our uh, talk, Lord. Help us watch our toil. Help us watch all of these aspects of our life. Help us de definitely and, and distinctively, deliberately place every element of our lives in a place where you can receive glory. Help us speak words that will help people around us come to you and become more like you. Please, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Glad you came. Pray for each other. Pray for each other.
slide out of my way Cause I want to know 